So um, last day, if you remember, we introduced, you know, for the first time, the Hamiltonian formalism for fields. And the way we did this is just by going back to the discrete system in which we had this infinite set of individual masses, and we took the continuum limit, as we did when we started with the Lagrangian formulation. And that led us to, uh, to this, uh, you know, final line here, which is that instead of having a Hamiltonian, what we have now is a Hamiltonian density, exactly in the same way as, you know, when we had a, a Lagrangian density, when we formulated the Lagrangian formulation. And also the canonical conjugate momentum is actually canonical conjugate momentum density, the derivative of this Lagrangian density with respect to the time derivative of the field, okay? Now, in practice, people don't talk about densities. That that we have already said several times, and that also happens here with the Hamiltonian formalism. So people talk about this pi here is the canonical conjugate momentum. They don't say density. And this H here, sometimes people, you know, talk about the Hamiltonian, not the Hamiltonian density. Uh, exactly as it happened with the Lagrangian formulation for discrete systems, the Hamiltonian density, okay, uh, is something which depends on the field and the canonical conjugate momentum, and also the gradient with respect to the uh, spatial components of the field, and maybe also the canonical conjugate momentum, but never, 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 you know, the, the time derivative of the field, okay? because the time derivative of the field is supposed to be written in terms of the canonical conjugate momentum by inverting by inverting this this relation here okay so now that we have you know the hamiltonian and we have formulated how to go from the lagrangian to the hamiltonian in terms of fields now we can just go for the equations of motion right so <clears throat> so this is the statement that i just made that that this equation here which defines the canonical conjugate momentum is to be used, you know, to rewrite the uh, time derivative of the field in terms of the uh, field itself, the canonical conjugate momentum. And we may allow, you know, special derivatives of the field or the canonical conjugate momentum, but not time derivatives. Okay. Now, equations of motion, right? So that's the next thing in line equations of motion. So we want to take the derivative of the Hamiltonian density with respect to, to the field, uh, to the canonical conjugate momentum, pi, okay? And remember what H is, right? So H is partial of L respect to Q dot, which is a field, right? Q dot of X minus the Lagrangian, which depends on Q, Q dot, and maybe also special derivatives of it. And remember this equation. Eh? Remember this always. Okay, so Q dot is not an independent variable. The Hamiltonian, let's write it explicitly. The Hamiltonian depends on Q, pi, and maybe, you know, the gradient of, of Q. And it could also be the gradient of pi with respect to spatial components. So let's take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to pi. Okay, so this is pi. So we have two terms. One is when we take the derivative of this thing with respect to pi, so that is q dot, obviously. But then we also have the derivative of L with respect to q dot times the derivative of q pi with respect to pi, right? Because now q, q dot depends on pi, like here. So there is, in, in this first term, there are two terms when I take the derivative, okay? And minus, and now here, you know, what depends on P, um, on, on this pi here is this Q dot. So this is derivative of L respect to Q dot, derivative of Q dot respect to pi. So this term cancels this term, and this is nothing but Q dot. So that's one equation already. So that's the first equation. Okay, now we're gonna go for the second equation. So any questions about this first equation, how we derived this first equation? No. Okay, so now 
Second equation, so derivative of h with respect to q, right? Because h depends on pi, that was the derivative of it. And now it depends on q as well, and then we'll see what the dependence on, on the gradient of q is. Okay, so dh with respect to q, okay? dh with respect to q, well, pi does not depend on q. Pi and q are independent, you know, variables. So, so here, this term does not exist when I take the derivative with respect to q. But there is the dependence of q dot on, on q. So that, that does exist. So that is dq dot respect to q. Minus, here the same thing. Derivative of L with respect to q dot. Derivative of q dot with respect to q. And then there is also the, the dependence on Q, the direct dependence on Q, okay? So now this term cancels this term again, and I find that this is minus the derivative of L respect to Q, okay? This is true, but this is not useful because it, it still mixes up, you know, the Hamiltonian and the Lagrangian. So I want to write down equations only for the Hamiltonian in the Hamiltonian formalism. So now we can use... Uh, using Lagrange's equations. Right, which says that, uh, sorry, just one second. Okay. Which says that the derivative of L with respect to Q equals time derivative of L with respect to Q dot plus the derivative respect to xi derivative of l with respect to q comma i right so those are Lagrange equations so that that means that I can write this in terms of the other of the other two okay and and I can also remember that this thing is the you know the definition of pi so this is nothing but pi dot plus derivative respect to xi derivative of l with respect to q comma i Okay, so I just, you know, use this in, in that previous equation. And what I find is that derivative of the Hamiltonian density with respect to Q equals minus all this. So it's minus pi dot minus derivative with respect to Xi. So that's only spatial components, partial of L with respect to Q comma I. Okay, that's just still no good, right? Because we still have the Lagrangian here. So we, we still need to, to do one more step, okay? So that we're going to do that more step right now. What is the derivative of h with respect to q comma i? Remember, h is pi q dot minus the Lagrangian, which depends on q, q dot, and q comma i, where q dot is a function of q, pi, and q comma i. Okay, so let's take this derivative of h with respect to q comma i. And what we find is that pi does not depend on that. All these variables are independent. So let me just write it here. h, h is a function of pi, q, and q comma i. Okay, so pi and q are independent, pi and q comma i are independent as well. So this derivative is, is now the derivative of q dot with respect to q comma i, because q dot does depend on q comma i, minus the derivative of L with respect to q dot, times derivative of q dot with respect to q comma i, minus the derivative of L with respect to q comma i, okay? This guy cancels that guy. And so therefore this is minus DL respect to Q comma I. Ah, so that means that the derivative with respect to the gradient of the field is the same for the Hamiltonian and the Lagrangian up to a sign. Okay, so that's what I need then. Okay, so now I can go back to this equation and use it here, right? And so what I'm going to find is that the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to Q, okay, minus the derivative with respect to Xi. Now I use this, this relation, partial of H with respect to Q comma I. Now this is minus pi dot, okay? 
So now we have the two equations, right, that we wanted. So I'm going to write, so this, this was the first one, and this is now the second one. So this is the second one. And I'm going to write down also the first one so that we have the two of them together. Partial of h respect to pi equals q dot. Okay. Good. So that is one equation. And this is the second equation. That's the first equation, if you wish. So that's the equivalent of, you know, p dot equals minus dh dq and q dot equals dh dp, right? So that's what we had for discrete systems. So that's the generalization for fields, for continuum system, continuous systems, okay? And together with, uh, uh, with nothing. So that's it. Now, uh, these derivatives are a little weird, right? So they are a little strange, a little weird. Uh, because, you know, one would not have expected this term here, this gradient. So this gradient here sounds, sounds strange. It actually is not as strange, but it's, it looks a little bit strange. So um, there is something that the mathematicians know about this. And in preparation of what is going to come, let me just define the following. If we define the following derivative, we're going to define a derivative like this, which is going to be a functional derivative. And we want to define a functional derivative that reproduces this result. And that's something that at, at this point sounds like a com complete invention. I'm just inventing this thing. But it, it will turn out that this functional derivative is something that the mathematicians have already studied. So it's going to be of use for us. And this definition of the functional derivative at this point is, as I'm saying, just an invention, is the following. Take the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is the integral over space of the Hamiltonian density. We are still in one dimension, although the generalization for three dimensions is going to be completely trivial. So this depends on the canonical conjugate momentum pi. Of course, this depends on x and t. It also depends on the field q, which also depends on x and t. And it depends on the gradient of the field q, which is also a function of x and t. So we define the functional derivative of the Hamiltonian, not the Hamiltonian density, the Hamiltonian with respect to the field Q as the following thing. The partial derivative of the Hamiltonian density now with respect to the same field Q minus the gradient of the same thing with respect to the gradient of the field. Okay, so, so notice the difference. Huh? I mean, it's the functional derivative of the Hamiltonian is the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian density minus the gradient of the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian density again with respect to the gradient of Q. And the same thing for pi. So the derivative, functional derivative, with respect to the canonical conjugate momentum density, if you wish, is the derivative of the Hamiltonian density with respect to that object. Okay, so this is the, the standard derivative. Whatever it says pi, you just take the derivative with respect to pi minus the derivative with respect to xi of the derivative of h with respect to pi comma i, if there is a gradient of pi. I mean, in the example that we just worked out, there was no such term, but in principle, you could have it. Okay, you could have it. If you define this functional derivative, okay, like this, 
well, I mean, since it's been an invention, okay, then we can write, you know, Hamilton's equations. These are Hamilton's equations. In a way, which look a little bit more familiar, maybe, because now they, they are going to be derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the canonical conjugate momentum. And now it's the functional derivative equals minus pi dot, okay? And the functional derivative of the Hamiltonian would is, sorry, this is a Q. And the functional derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the field equals, uh, and this is a plus, equals minus, minus pi dot of x and t, okay? So these strange looking equations with this definition of the functional derivative become, you know, more naive, if you wish, more more along the lines of what uh, one would have guessed, okay? Still, we have to decide what is this functional derivative, and that will come, okay? So now, this is just a notation. So we just define the functional derivative of the integral of something like this. So that's the definition, okay? That is the definition. And we'll see what the mathematicians have to tell us about this. Now that we have already defined uh, uh, we have already obtained the uh, Hamilton's equations in a Hamiltonian formalism. We could apply it to, a, to an example. But before we do that, any questions or comments? Any question or comment? No questions. Okay, so let's go for the example. Let's look at a simple example that, that we can use to see how these things work, okay? So this is going to be the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian for the Higgs field. which as we know is a scalar field, okay? The Higgs field is, I'm going to denote it by H of X and T, okay? So that's the field. And I'm going to use units in which H bar equals C equals one as, as usual, okay? And no interactions. So I'm just going to look at, you know, the kinetic term, including the mass. So what is the Lagrangian for this field H? Well, it is it is a relativistic theory. So it, it is d mu H, d mu H minus one half of m squared H square, where H is a field. Huh? So it depends on X and T. That, that we have already seen, okay? We also know that the Lagrangian is d3x of the Lagrangian density. And the action S, or sometimes people call it I, the action is going to be the integral dt of L. So that means the integral d for L, d for X of the Lagrangian density. Okay, so we can make this, the, the <clears throat> you know, the time and space dependence explicit here because this d mu d mu is, you know, the time derivative of H, the time derivative of H. And now there is the space derivative, the space derivative, but one of them is going to have a minus sign, right? This one here has a minus sign, three minus signs for each x, y, and z. So that means there is minus one half gradient of h dot gradient of h, right? And then the mass term. Okay, so that's what it looks like. All right, so of course we can also write this thing as one half of h dot square, that's what it is, minus, you could also write this thing as gradient of h square minus one half of m square h square. So that's the Lagrangian. So given this Lagrangian, how do we construct the Hamiltonian? 
Well, first of all, we have to identify who is the canonical conjugate momentum pi, which is the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to the time derivative of the field, of the field H. So how much is this? How much is this derivative? Who can tell me? H dot? Yes, as simple as that. Is H dot of X and T, okay? So now, Hamiltonian density is pi H dot minus the Lagrangian, right? But remembering that H dot is actually pi. So this first term is pi square minus the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian written in terms of pi, okay? So that is minus one half of pi square plus one half of gradient of H square plus one half of M square H square. Okay, so that means pi square minus a half of pi square is a half of pi square plus a half of the gradient of H square plus a half of mass square H square. Okay, and the Hamiltonian is going to be integral over a space of this Hamiltonian density, which as you see, depends on H, depends on pi, and also depends on the gradient of H. So it's one of the examples that we already treated before in the, in the previous screen, okay? Now, we have the Lagrangian, we have the Hamiltonian. Now we can, you know, compare the equations of motion in the Lagrangian formalism, in the Hamiltonian formalism, and check that, you know, that they are completely compatible. Any questions up to now? No. Okay. Oh. So, Euler Lagrange equations. Okay. So, DL with respect to the field minus d mu dl with respect to the field comma mu equals zero, right? <clears throat> okay, so we can go back. Remember what the Lagrangian was? It was this thing here. Okay, so the Lagrangian was one half d mu h d mu h minus a half m square h square. Okay, so we apply this thing. So, you know, what is DL with respect to H? So this is DL with respect to H. It is minus M square H, okay? Minus D mu, derivative of L with respect to H comma mu. And here we have to be careful. We already did this thing once. Huh? It is very convenient to write this thing as one half d mu h, d mu nu h, g mu nu. And take the derivative with respect to mu, d with respect to h comma mu. That means that there are gonna be a factor of two here. We already did this thing once. Okay, so let me just tell you what the answer is going to be. Okay, so this is going to be d mu h. That's what comes from this. This is d mu h. Okay, and this is zero. So written in a more familiar way, it is this thing. So that's the equations of motion in the Lagrange in Lagrange formalism. And now we can write it, <clears throat> you know, making explicit time and, and space. So this is going to be derivative with respect to time twice. Okay. And now this is going to be derivative with respect to space with the index upstairs and derivative of space, space with the index downstairs, so that is minus Laplacian of H plus M square H equals zero. So that's, so it is like a wave equation, except that it has this term, okay? Now, uh, any problem with these calculations, which are very simple as you see, but you have to be very careful because otherwise you can easily screw up, you know, this sign here or this sign there, you know, the factor of two. Does anybody need that we do this thing more carefully, more slowly? 
or is it already clear? All clear. Okay, so that that is the <clears throat> Lagrange equations. Now let's go for Hamilton's equations. Hamilton's equations. Okay, so let's take a look at those equations we just obtained, okay? So they are written like this, okay? Or like this. This I should also put in a box because it's going to be of use in the future. Okay, Hamilton's equation. So, so that is h dot equals, who can tell me? Let's take the functional derivative of h with respect to who? Is the uh, functional derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to? With respect to pi. Yes, with respect to pi. And this is what? In, written in terms of the Hamiltonian density. Who can tell me? Let us write down the Hamiltonian density. Hamiltonian density was, if you remember, a half pi squared plus a half of the gradient of h squared plus a half of mass squared h squared of x and t. Uh, h always depends on x and t, and pi <coughs> does too. Huh? So this, let me just make it explicit, is a half of pi of x and t. Huh? Okay, so what is this derivative of the Hamiltonian written in terms of the Hamiltonian density? This is pi. This is the derivative of the Hamiltonian density with respect to pi. Uh, by the way, here is a square. I forgot this is square. Huh? Remember, I, I mean, intuitively it's the same thing. It, it is a p square plus something. It has to be a square. So, square. So, we take the derivative of the Hamiltonian density with respect to pi. Yes, we will compute it later. And, and what else? The gradient minus the derivative with respect to xi. Let's put this right here a clear i of the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to pi, comma i. Okay, so this Hamiltonian in particular does not depend on the gradient of pi, so this term is going to be zero. But this term, of course, remains, so what I get is pi. So h dot equals pi of x and t. Yeah? So that's one of them. The other one is minus pi dot equals derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to uh, h. Yeah, now I call it h. Back to h. So this is why these functional derivatives are useful because they are easy to remember, right? It's the same formally, formally it's the same as what you have written for discrete systems. Okay, so now let's, let us write this thing in terms of the Hamiltonian density, which is in practice what we have. So what is this thing? Who can tell me? What should I write here? Derivative of the of the Hamiltonian density respect h. Yes. Minus the gradient. Yes. Of the derivative of the Hamiltonian density respect the gradient. Exactly. So you see, it's formally the same. So that's why it's easy to remember. Now there is a dependence on the gradient here. So this term is not going to be zero anymore. Huh? So what is the derivative of h with respect to of the Hamiltonian density with respect to the field H, well, it is m square H, right? That comes from this guy. Minus the derivative with respect to space of the derivative of the Hamiltonian density with respect to the gradient. 
why should I write here? In this parenthesis, why should I write? Who can tell me? The gradient, no? The gradient, how? I mean, I'm, I'm writing the derivative of h with respect to h comma i, so why should I write? It is the gradient, but, but I, I have an i, I have an index here, so why should I write? D i h. Right, d i h, but the i or the i? Upstairs, better. Okay, so you say upstairs. If you write it upstairs, that means that this thing is downstairs, so that means this is d, d, x, i, upstairs remember that if we keep the notation if we keep the notation of relativity the index downstairs means that derivative of respect to the index upstairs right remember and here you say upstairs so if this is upstairs then this means that i'm taking the derivative with respect to the index downstairs of x now these guys are positive x y and z but these guys are minus x minus y minus z. So if I if I write this thing, I'm writing m squared h plus dx dx dy dy dz dz. So that is Laplacian of h. Right? That is what I would write if I do this. But is this what I'm supposed to do? Or not? You see, this is part of the of the complications. They are not terribly complex. It's just you know deciding whether the sign is one or the other. But you have to be careful, right? You have to be careful. Let, let us write this Hamiltonian, okay, more explicitly. So I'm going to write first the mass term because the mass term is, is, is not conflictive, right? So one half m squared h squared. And now one half, and remember it was gradient of h, gradient of h. That's what it said, right? Um, I'm not cheating, huh? Here it is. Now, notice one thing, at this point, I'm, I'm talking about the Hamiltonian density, but it's the Hamiltonian. So all the relativity is gone because I have I have already singled out time and not a space. And I singled out time because I'm taking the derivative with respect to the time derivative of h. So all the all the uh, covariance is gone. Right? Time now it plays a special role in the Hamiltonian formulation. So what does this gradient of h, gradient of h mean? Right, what does this thing mean? It means if I take the derivative with respect to xi, I take the derivative with respect to xi again, right? That's what I do. I, I don't need to put a, another parenthesis here. Right? This is what I'm doing. I and I. This thing is partial of h with respect to x times partial of h with respect to x plus partial of h with respect to y, partial of h with respect to y plus partial of h with respect to z, partial of h with respect to z. So it's x, x, y, y, and z, z, plus, plus, plus. Right? So this is not right. This is not right. This is right, okay? And that means that this is a plus. Um, except that there is this minus here. <laughs> the minus remains. 
it is this minus here. This is derivative with respect to x, x, y, y, and z, z. And the minus remains. I mean, I had to change it because before there was there was this, this i here upstairs, okay? But now it's not. So this is minus as exactly, exactly as this minus here. So this means that this is what I have, okay? Because it's dx dx, dy dy, dz dz. That's the Laplacian with plus, plus, plus. Or if you observe this minus, 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 minus. Okay, so now we have these two equations. So this is minus pi dot equals this and h dot equals that. Okay, so from this equation, we can take the derivative and then pi dot is going to be h double dot, right? Okay, and then I can use this thing here. So this is gonna be minus h double dot equals m squared h minus Laplacian of h, right? Okay, so then I can bring the second derivative on the right-hand side and write zero equals m squared h minus Laplacian of h plus time derivative of h twice equals zero. Right, and that's exactly the same as that equation there. Okay, it's exactly the same. So this and this. Okay, so the two um, formalisms are completely equivalent. Now, any questions? All these manipulations are simple, but you have to be careful. Any questions or comments? I have a question. Okay. Um, why you have to change the sign if you are not considering relativity? I, I didn't change any sign. I, I wrote <clears throat> this the Hamiltonian density like this. You agree? Yeah. Okay. So let us look at what it says, okay? And it says gradient of h, right? So this, for, I mean, to, to write this thing, you don't need to know relativity at, at all. This is dh dx, dh dy, dh dz. You agree? Yes. Uh, as it was, you know, uh, when you started to study physics, right? It hasn't changed. So what is this a square? Is the square of this thing or the dot product of this thing with itself. With itself, right? No minus signs. Why should I be, why should it be a minus sign anywhere? If you just have, you know, this killer product of this with this, right? So that's what we are doing. So here, this is dh dx dh dx plus dh dz dh dy dh dy plus dh dz dh dz. And it's plus, plus, plus. But the then, minus sign is because I have this minus sign here. Okay? If, but if the i is downstairs or upstairs, you said that this is a change of sign. Yes. But yes, that's right. That, so so, so that's what, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finish, finish the sentence, yes. Why is that change of, of sign if you are not considering the metric of relativity? Right. I'm not. Okay. So let me say it again. I'm not changing any sign. I'm not changing any sign. So I'm, I'm just I'm just copying what it says here. Okay. Let me just let me just do it again. Yeah. yeah but then the fact that the index is downstairs or upstairs is irrelevant if there is no change of sign. Yes, so, so exactly. So now you can you can follow two different, you know, um, ways of doing things. So you can say, so this thing here is the derivative with respect to x, derivative of h. Derivative with respect to x. Of h, so this is as we have said, okay? dx, dx, dy, dy, dz, dz, plus, 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 okay? In which case, this thing here 
is going to be derivative respect to xi, xi of the derivative respect to xi of h, right? Because what I have to, I have to take the derivative. So let me just make it, this thing explicit, right? Again. Or if you wish, even more explicit. That's what it means, right? That's what I'm doing. So I, I'm taking the derivative respect to the three variables, x, x, y, y, and z, z. And, and is x, x, y, y, and z, z. There is here, there is no up and down. They are both up. If you want to put them both down, you can also do that. Then you have a minus sign here and a minus sign there. But it is a product of two minus signs is again a plus sign. Santi. Yes. Yeah, I, I think what Xavi is trying to, to ask is, um, why do you have to do a distinction between the the up the up uh, index and the sub index if we are in, if we are not taking account relativity because right now, if we uh, okay. don't take account relativity the metric should be the identity right yeah yeah. That's the question. yeah 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 so then what you can do because what you can do now is say okay since now I don't have relativity I'm going to forget about you know indices upstairs or downstairs and then derivative respect to xi is going to be the same as derivative respect to xi, whether I put it upstairs or downstairs. And then I can do whatever I want. I can put it here, I can put it there. It's all the same. Yes, you can do that too. In the end, what you have here is dx, dx, dy, dy, dz, dz. If you follow, if you follow the convention. Now you, you tell me, I'm going to change the convention. I'm going to forget about relativity. And now, since I don't have relativity anymore, I can just you know put upstairs and downstairs the indices completely freely in any way I want. Well, OK, fine. I mean, this is going to be dx, dx, dy, dy, dz, dz. Whether you write it like this or you write it in another way, like this. Who cares? It's all the same. Yes. Okay. You, can do, you can do that too, yes. What I'm saying, so this is this is perfect. Once you write this thing like this, there is no relativity anymore. This is x, x, y, y, and z, z. And therefore, you can forget about the metric and everything at this level, OK? And then you just take derivatives, OK? So you take derivatives. Another thing that you can do is, well, I don't forget about relativity. If I don't forget about relativity, then I distinguish between upstairs and downstairs, and then I have to be careful. And what appears here is both of them the same, either upstairs or downstairs. In which case, again, I have dx, dx, dy, dy, dz, dz. What I cannot do is one upstairs and the other downstairs. That I cannot do, because then you're going to have a minus sign. Okay, uh, okay. Is that clear or not? So let me yeah, just yeah. Put, let me just put both upstairs if you wish. Thank you. Okay, so that's it. So in the end, this this is what is you know completely independent of these you know conventions. Now, let's discuss the energy momentum tensor. Remember, what was the energy momentum tensor? Uh, in Nether's theorem, we found that there was a conservation, right? In, in its simplest form, it was dx mu j mu equals 0, where j mu had this expression. It was derivative of L with respect to phi comma mu variation of phi plus delta mu nu times the Lagrangian density minus the derivative of L with respect to phi comma mu, phi comma nu, delta x nu. 
okay? And we said this thing here is minus T mu nu. T mu nu is the energy momentum tensor. And the question now is, I mean, why? I mean, what does this thing have to do with the energy or the momentum for that matter? Well, I mean, why is this combination something that has to do with energy of any kind, okay? And now we're going to be able to, to say a little bit, you know, why this thing here is, is something that has to do with the energy or, or the momentum for that matter, okay? And this is thanks to the fact that we already discussed the Hamiltonian formalism. So the Hamiltonian is, is here. Is, is hidden here somewhere. And we are, we are now we are going to bring it out. Okay, we're going to be able to see where the Hamiltonian is sitting in this. So, and we're going to do that with an example to make it as simple as possible. So we're going to take a Lagrangian density, which is a Lagrangian which depends on the field phi and space and time derivatives of the field phi. And I'm going to take a relativistic theory for reasons that you will see is, is advantageous. It's advantageous to think of relativity now. Okay, so this is a relativistic theory. Okay, so L, as you can see, is independent of X. There is no X dependence. So in principle, remember, there could be an X dependence, but in this particular case, the, X depend, the explicit X dependence is not there. And as a consequence of that, uh, there is an obvious symmetry. There is an obvious symmetry transformation, right? Which is, if I take X mu and I change X mu into X prime mu, which is x mu plus delta of x mu, right? If I change this thing, right, the Lagrangian is with delta x mu, I'm going to take this thing a constant. Right? If I do this thing, then, you know, there is no change. There is no change. The Lagrangian stays the same, okay? The field changes. So now we have to study, you know, what is the phi, what is this, everything, okay? So let's let's do this thing. What is the phi, what is the delta x? This we already know. This this is going to be epsilon. So this part is epsilon. But what is the phi? Well, phi of x is going to change into phi of, well, now x is x prime minus epsilon, right? I'm just shifting, you know, from x to x prime, being x plus epsilon, so then phi of x is phi of x, which is x prime minus epsilon, okay? And this is a new function of x prime, all right? Now, if you remember what this d phi was, this d phi was the transformation of the field itself without taking into account the transformation of the variable, the transformation of the field itself. But this field, phi, did not change. It's not as if, you know, this was a vector and I'm rotating this vector, in which, in which case there would be an extra transformation here. No, 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 no. This guy is not change. It's only the variable that changes. So if you go back to what this meant in another theorem, it meant that the field itself does not change. So this term in this particular case is zero. Okay? Is this clear? You have to remember the conditions of another theorem, but if you go back, you will see that this term here was taking into account only the transformation of the field itself, regardless of the variable change, okay? Like for instance, in the case of far rotation, we did explicitly, we explained that in the case of far rotation, the field being a vector would rotate itself, 
So this is the transformation that goes in there, but not the transformation of the variable. Transformation of the variable goes here. Okay, so that means that this d phi is zero. So that means that nether theorem, in this case, what it says is that the derivative with respect to x mu of this j mu, which is delta mu nu of the Lagrangian density minus dl d phi comma mu phi comma nu, this thing is zero. And if we call this thing t mu nu with a minus sign or without, it doesn't matter because the whole thing is zero. Then this can be written as d time derivative of t zero nu minus, uh, so this is d zero of t zero zero plus d i of t i zero equals zero in which I've chosen the index nu, this index nu to be zero. You agree with me with this? Okay. Right, I mean, I have d mu, so let me, let me just do it here, maybe. So this is d dx mu, sorry, dx mu, of t mu nu equals zero. That's what it says. And I'm going to choose nu equals zero. So that is d dx zero t zero zero plus d dx i upstairs now, huh? t i zero equals zero. And that's what I'm doing. Exactly this. You agree? Yeah. So now let us concentrate on the first term, T00, this guy. Okay, so who is this guy? And what we find is that T00 is derivative of L with respect to the time derivative of phi times the time derivative of phi, uh, remember, um, is the derivative of L, this is my with a minus sign. Huh? So to be completely honest, I have to put a minus sign. So T0, 0 is derivative of L with respect to phi comma zero, phi comma zero. Derivative of L with respect to phi comma zero, phi comma zero. If you wish I can put here also phi comma zero, it's the same. Minus the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian, Delta zero zero, which is one. Delta zero zero, which is one. Okay, so this is the derivative of L with respect to phi dot times phi dot minus the Lagrangian. Aha, uh -huh, so this is this is an old friend, right? What is this? Hamiltonian density. Exactly. So that's a Hamiltonian density. So is the energy density. It's the energy density when the Hamiltonian is the energy, right? Which happens very often. So that's why this thing is called the energy momentum tensor. So you see in the in the zero to zero component is the Hamiltonian is sitting in that in that component. Okay. So if now if if we are in a situation in which the Hamiltonian is the energy, if the Hamiltonian is the energy then the integral d3x of t0,0, of course, is going to be the total energy. Because it's going to be the integral over the space, all the space of the energy density. So this is going to be the energy density. Right? So then it's going to be the total energy. Okay? And, and what else do we know? Well, I mean, let's go back to this equation here. Let's go back to this equation. So if T0,0 zero zero is the energy density, what, 
what is T0i? What is T0i? Well, I mean, we know that T0 mu is a vector. Well, is is a four vector actually. Is a four vector because that's what the index mu is saying, right? That this object, you know, transforms as a four vector with it actually is going to be a covariant. It's a covariant for vector. So if you, if you wish, we can say covariant for vector. It is a covariant for vector whose time component is the energy density, right? So if I take the integral t3x of t0 mu, I'm, I'm taking the integral d3x of t0, 0, and I'm taking the integral d3x of t0i, right? This is math, mathematics. There is no physics yet. But I find that the integral d3x of t0, 0, 0 is the total energy of the system, of the field system. So, and I know that the whole thing here is a four vector. This is a four covariant, a covariant four vector. I, when I integrate, <clears throat> it's going to be it's going to be the integral over all the space of the, this covariant four vector. So who is who is the companion of the energy in a relativistic four vector? The momentum density. Exactly. So this thing is going to be the total linear momentum. So what we find is that this object here is the total four momentum of the field, whose time component is the total energy and whose you know uh, three components is the, the linear momentum. So as you can see, inside this tensor here, we have objects that are in interesting, which are the total energy, if you wish the Hamiltonian, and then the, the linear momentum, okay? And ob obviously what um, Nether's theorem is telling us is this conservation here, and this conservation here, but does it say? But this, so the conservation, Nether's Nether's theorem conservation law for this system is going to tell us what we can suspect, right? We have a Lagrangian which does not depend explicitly on time or space. So therefore, what is going to happen is that this system, you know, conserves energy and linear momentum. And indeed, that's what happens, right? Because the conservation law is this one. So we have derivative 0 of t0, 0, 0 plus derivative i of t i0 equals 0. I can integrate over a space. So that's going to be derivative respect to time. So I can put time here to make it more explicit of integral d3x t0, 0, 0 equals minus integral d3x of di ti0, okay? Now, this thing here, is the total energy, and this thing here, we can write using Gauss's law, right? We can write using Gauss's theorem as, you know, the integral of t i zero d s i over the surface that surrounds all the space and time. Right. So what this thing says is that the variation of the total energy in a certain region of space is due to the fact that this momentum, Ti0, this is Ti0, eh? 
is going out of the surface. Okay, so that means this. So the variation in a certain surface, in a certain volume, this is the volume B. The variation in this volume B is because it's flowing out, you know, uh, of the surface S. So that's a conservation that we see. We see that energy is conserved because it changes with time in a certain volume B due to the fact that it goes through the surface surrounding this volume B, okay? The, the linear momentum goes out of this surface. Okay, so that's, that's a conservation of energy for fields. Any questions? Do you guys recognize here Gauss's theorem or not? Yes. Okay. Actually, I forgot a minus sign here. There should be a minus sign. This, this minus sign doesn't disappear. Okay. Now, now is the time to define functionals and functional derivatives. So now we are going to do a little excursion into mathematics, okay? Very little excursion though. Huh? So these are gonna be functionals and functional derivatives. So this goes, of course, by the name of functional functional analysis. Functionals and functional derivatives. Okay. So what is a function? So let's go back to principles, right? To the first principles. What is a function? So a function is a mapping. A mapping is what we say, what we call una aplicación. Is a mapping f from x, which is going to be a vector in our n, to f of x, and this is a number. So it's a mapping of the space into the the real numbers. So we can just think of a scalar function f to make things as simple as possible. So that's a, that's a function. So what is a functional? So a functional is also a mapping, but now the variable is not x, is not you know a vector or, or a number, in this case it's not a vector, but a functional f acts on a function, okay? So this is a function, and what class of, what class of functions we are going to be looking at? So it's going to be all those functions which are infinitely differentiable, defined on Rn. So these are functions, infinitely differentiable functions. Infinitely differentiable functions of x. So now I take one function out of the infinitely differentiable functions, and then I construct a functional of this function, which is a number. And in general, it's going to be a complex number. Okay, so now the variable, instead of being x, is the function itself. And the functional of this function is a mapping which takes one of these functions and gives me a number, a complex number in general. So example, okay? So now we, we need an example to see what this means. So what is a functional of the functional f? For instance, the integral between one and two of this function. Okay, so I take the function f and I compute the integral. So this functional acting on another function g is going to be the integral between one and two 
of that function g, etc. Okay, so now, now the uh, the variable becomes the function itself, and and x is nothing. Okay, x doesn't play any role. X does not even appear here because this integral is the same as this integral. I can use any variable I want. So x becomes a dummy index, right? So x, y are dummy now. Are dummy. They don't they don't say anything. They don't say anything because I can use any any symbol I want. This the result does not depend on which symbol I use. Okay, it only depends on the function I stick in this integral, whether it is f or it is g or what. Okay, so what is the right way to think about this? So this integral between one and two of the x of f of x is the continuum version of something which in the discrete version would be something like this. So this is continuum. Continuum. Okay, and this is discrete. In some sense, the x, which is a continuum variable, a continuous variable, right, here would become an index. Right, so that's more or less what we did when we went from a discrete system, okay, with all those infinite masses to a string, to a continuous system. We did something like this. So that's that's the way we want to think of these functionals now, okay? And the same way we're going to the you know define a functional derivative. Functional derivative. And we're going to start by doing it in one dimension, no? one dimension, to make things really simple. And then we can generalize it very easily. So that's the definition. The definition is we take the functional derivative of a functional with respect to a given function as the limit when epsilon goes to zero of this function evaluated at the function incremented by some quantity, in this particular case is epsilon times the direct delta minus the functional without that increment and divided by epsilon. So you recognize here that this is some sort of derivative because I'm taking the functional at a variable incremented by some quantity minus the function without the incrementation divided by this incrementation, essentially, right? So that's the definition, okay? We'll see that this definition actually does what we would expect it to do, okay? When we discretize it. And we'll see that this delta, this direct delta here will become the discrete Kronecker delta in the discrete limit. But let's first take this, this definition as, as it is, okay? So examples. Examples of use of this definition of the uh, <coughs> functional derivative. So what is the functional derivative of one back to a function? Well, one does not depend on it. So I, if it does not depend on it, then I cannot increment it. I subtract itself, so therefore I'm going to get zero. Right? It's going, that's, the, that's, that's just one does not depend on f, so therefore, you know, this term and this term cancels because there is no incrementation. What is the derivative of f of x with respect to f of z? Well, now, this functional, which is a stupid functional because it doesn't even have the integral or anything, it's just f itself, is going to be f of x plus epsilon minus f of x. So the f of x is going to cancel divided by epsilon. So this thing is going to be delta of x minus z. Right? Because remember that this y is this y. Yeah? This, is, this is important. Huh? This y here. 
is this one here. So the final answer is going to depend on y, on this y. It does not depend on x, but it does depend on y. So this thing here now is this direct delta of z minus x. And what is the derivative of a given function, g of x, with respect to another function, g, g of z, or the other way around, whatever? Well, this is also zero because g does not depend on f. So when when I increment, you know, I I this I displace f since g does not depend on f. I don't I don't displace. I don't increment anything. So then it's zero. Okay. So these are simple examples of this functional derivative. And you can also check that, you know, the functional derivative with respect to a function of, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me just put the, the same notation that I have in my notes, f of x, of a functional of f times another functional of f follows the same rule of the derivative, of the normal derivative. So this is the function derivative of the first functional with respect to the function times the second functional plus the first functional times the derivative of the second functional with respect to the function. So this derivative of the product of two functionals is just a consequence of the of the definition of the functional derivative, which is so similar to the deriv standard derivative that you know this rule also also applies. Okay, and also the chain rule. The chain rule also follows. Okay, so if I take the functional derivative with respect to a function f, let me call it f f of z of a functional of a functional of f. So it's a functional of a functional, right? So that's where the chain rule applies. So this is going to be the integral of the functional derivative of this guy with respect to phi of y, okay? Times the functional derivative of phi of f of y with respect to f of z dy okay so that's that's the chain rule okay now this could be at first a little confusing so let us make this note which is supposed to clarify in case of doubt what is it that one is supposed to do and so the note says the following okay so f of x can be thought can be thought of as f sub i, where i is, this i is a continuous index, x, okay? So this x here, you can think of it as the continuous version of an index i. Yeah. Instead of a discrete index i that can go from 1 to n as usual. So let us check that indeed this works. <clears throat> so what is the derivative, functional derivative of fx with respect to fy? So this we say is the limit when epsilon goes to zero. Sorry, epsilon goes to zero of f of x plus epsilon delta of x minus y, that, that was the definition, minus f of x divided 
by epsilon, right? So that was the definition. This cancels this, and we get delta of x minus y. So that was the, uh, the functional derivative. And what we are claiming is that this is the continuous version of a discrete version in which you would take that x is an index, y is another index, and now you would say the derivative of fi with respect to fj equals limit when epsilon goes to zero. Again, when epsilon goes to zero of fi plus epsilon delta ij, so now we discretize it, minus fi divided by epsilon. This cancels this. So therefore, this is delta ij. So indeed, what you find is that, you know, this follows the rules of just, you know, the naive discretization, as if x and y would become discrete, and then the direct delta would become a chronic delta, right? So this is discrete, and this is continuous. Okay, and that also works in other cases, right? So, for instance, other examples. Other examples. So, imagine that we want to take the functional derivative with respect to a function. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it now j of x of the integral with respect to y of phi of y times j of y, right? So, this is now my functional. So this is now my functional of j. Yeah? I take j and I integrate it with a given function, phi, whatever. This phi is given. This phi is a given function. OK, so what is this? So this is the integral dy. Phi of y does not depend on j. So this is the functional derivative of j with respect to j, of j of y with respect to j of x. This thing is delta of x minus y, or y minus x is the same. Delta of x minus y is the same as delta of y minus x. So therefore, when I integrate, this is nothing but phi of x, right? And indeed, the derivative with respect to j of x, of something which does not depend on anything other than j, is something which depends on x x, x, all right? Discrete version. The discrete version of this thing would be the derivative with respect to j i of the sum over k of phi k j k, right? Instead of summing, <clears throat> instead of integrating over a variable y, now we have to sum discrete sum over an index k. And this y has nothing to do with the x. This k has nothing to do with the i. So this is the sum over k, phi of k, derivative of jk with respect to ji. Of course, this is delta ik. And so this is phi i. And again, we see that, yes, the, the dictionary works, right? So this is a good thing to remember. Whenever you have some doubts as to you know, how to operate with this functional derivative, all you have to think is that this index x becomes discrete, OK? And then you discretize everything. Do the calculation, and then go back to the continuum. All right. Any questions so far? So now the question that, we re that remains to be done is that we have to apply this for formalism of functional derivatives and see what we can do with it. And we'll see that it's useful and that it, it actually reproduces, you know, the definition of functional derivative that we invented, okay, at the beginning of the class, right? We had to invent it. So what, what this means is that uh, it turns out that the, mathema the mathematicians had already invented that, okay? So we are going to use you know, all the formalism that the mathematicians ha have invented. We don't need much more, but actually we don't need anything more than what I I've already told you. Eh? So this is all the rules that you will ever need, okay? Any questions or comments?
no questions. All right. So, uh, so I'm going to leave it at this point. But before I, I just, you know, um, close the, the session, close this class. Remember one thing, OK? If I integrate over x, I don't care about the limits, but let's say minus infinity to plus infinity, OK? The derivative with respect to x of delta of x times a function, f of x. What is the result of this? Who can tell me? In other words, what is the derivative of the Dirac delta? Who can tell me this? I think it is the, the derivative of the function evaluated at zero. So it's f prime of zero. Is I that yes? Just like that? I would say it's not the derivative, but only f at zero. F at zero. OK, so then it, it would be the same as this. Because this is also F at zero. So these two things are the same. Is this true? Maybe not. No, I think you have to integrate by parts and realize that the delta outside of an integral is zero everywhere. OK, so the, right. So the, the two things are not the same. So this is different from this. Dirac delta is one thing. The derivative of the Dirac delta is another thing, not the same. OK, so the, the you know, the second line is true. And the first line we have to fix is not not exactly correct yet. A minus sign? Yes, exactly. That's what it, it was lacking a minus sign. Yes. Uh, distributions are objects which allow the integration by parts. If you remember, I don't know whether this was, you know, uh, explained in, the, in advanced mathematical methods last year, because I don't know whether you, all of you took this, this, this subject. I don't know. But the, the question to remember about direct deltas is that, first of all, direct deltas are objects which only makes sense under the integral sign, OK? So that's that's already clear here, right? A, a Dirac delta, delta of x is not something that I, I know what it is, because it's either 0 or infinity, right? A 0, I know what it is, but infinity, I don't know what it is, right? Infinity is not a number. OK, so, so that's one thing. So the, the Dirac delta, as any other distribution, only makes sense you know, uh, under the integral sign. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that Dirac delta, as any other distribution, can only act, as in this case, can only act on functions which vanish sufficiently quickly at infinity. And this is what is called, you know, with bounded support. OK, so f of x has to have bounded support. That means. It has to vanish at both ends sufficiently fast. And that, in practice, what that means is that it guarantees that you can use integration by parts and throw away you know, the contribution that comes from both ends. So that's why this thing is the same. Oops, this thing is the same as integral dx minus infinity to plus infinity delta of x derivative respect to x of f of x with a minus sign, OK? So I'm just integrating by parts, throwing away the boundary terms, the, the contribution from the two uh, endpoints, OK? And the minus sign comes from for integration by parts. And then this is precisely this thing. So this is something you have to remember about the Dirac delta. We're going to need it you know, in the next class. All right, so that's all for, for today.